Okay, we are at the Shimatsu and we're going to get ready to do a compression test on our wood samples. Now at this point we've already watched a lecture kind of about wood and we talked to the fact that we have probably two samples that were dry. We're going to do one longitudinal with the grain flow going up and down here. We're going to do another sample where the grain flow is going sideways here and that is transverse to the loading. So we're going to compress these two samples and compare the results. Likewise, I have two wet samples. Now I have mine in a bag because I've been letting them sit here for a while. And we're going to be able to compare our moisture content. So I have two samples again, longitudinal and transverse, that I'm going to compare and match. One of the things we want to talk about is going to be this new little tool. We're going to take out the safety guards off the tool, put them inside the little box right here. We want to be very careful with these because they're sharp and we don't want to bend them. We're going to turn this on. And what this tool does is lets us measure the moisture content in the material. And we want to record that for each sample. So if I come in here and I put my dry lumber sample on there, it's not reading anything. That's because it's dry. There's zero water in that sample. If I come over here and plug into this sample, I'm going to see I've got about 14% moisture on here. Now we've let these soak in water and made sure we had moisture in them. If I come in here and get this sample, I'm up at a high percentage of almost 17%. So I can tell that these are definitely the wet samples and that these are going to be my dry samples at zero. These should be near zero because we had those in the drying oven drying out. One of the things I want to point out is we actually cut all these samples the same height and initially when we bought the material we had about 11 percent moisture content in the wood so when we dried them they shrunk okay and when we hydrated the other two samples, they actually changed size and got bigger. So what we're seeing is the dimensions changed a little bit. We had a nominal dimension of five inches for all these, and they were all five inch. But you're going to probably measure these and record them in your lab sheet and note that the dimensions have changed with moisture content. That would be a neat lab for the future is what happens dimensionally to lumber when we have different moisture contents in that lumber. So once we're done with the tool, let's put our tips back on, close it up, and we can set it down for the next group to use. So while we're at the machine, we've already used this machine before, the Shimatsu is to do our test. We know how to use the uh, teach pendant over here, hit hand jog, and we can go high speed, and we can move it up and down. Again, we gotta take hand jog mode off when we actually wanna run the test. We have the tooling set up right now inside for compressing these samples, and we wanna make sure we center that sample up in the fixture there. And the test sample we're going to do here is going to be inch compression. That's our method that we're going to use. And one of the things we want to point out, because this is all just refresher for you guys, whenever you get the sample loaded in there, we're going to hit zero force, zero stroke, and we're going to compress that, and we're going to capture that ultimate load data with respect to the stroke. Now, we're not using an extensiometer to capture our deflection. We're going to be able to get that data through our stroke. So on this one, we're not just wanting the maximum force or anything. What we want to do is look at the force respect to stroke at different displacements and we're going to want to plot all four of these on a similar graph so we can see the differences in the behavior of these materials. So we're going to need to go up and do file export our data for each test as a common delimited file, a CVS file that we can bring into Excel and manipulate that data. Again, we've already covered this and how to do that in the tensile test. So if you're having a hard time dealing with the data, go back to that video on tensile test and review those methods that we use for bringing the data from here, bringing it into Excel, and creating our graphs. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and step through and load my sample. I'm going to put hand jog on and come into high speed mode. I'm going to get down here where I can put my sample in here centrally loaded. I'm going to come down and look and if I touch my sample, that's okay. That's basically made contact, and you're probably gonna do that very same thing. Just have your teammate, your partner, hit reset, and we can zero that out at that point. Again, you probably wanna stop just a 16th of an inch or so before. Again, your plot data will start showing it when it makes contact, and you may just have to truncate that data off in your spreadsheet. So I'm now ready for a test. I've got my hand jog off, I've got my sample loaded. I have my safety door down. All these are zeroed out. I'm now able to come in here and do a start test. And we're just going to let this thing run. And so my sample is loading. 
And again, I may have to throw that little first bit of data out, but I can see my sample is nice and linear in behavior, and we're going to failure. And we're just going to let this run for quite a ways, even after failure, and capture that data and export it. We're going to repeat this experiment for all three tests. Again, label your files as dry longitudinal, dry transverse, wet longitudinal, wet transverse, so you can compare the two. And one of the things you also want to look at is how did the sample fail? And if I'm watching the sample over there, I can tell that it is cracking and there are some shear planes, some things are happening, and that's going to be a nice thing. And I can also tell that I did pass my UTS and I am failing. So I'm just going to go ahead and crush it and look at it and see how this sample actually failed. So once you feel like you've had your sample break enough, you can come in here and hit stop the test and then go retrieve your sample. I'm going to raise the safety door, reach in, and I can now look at my sample and see how it failed. Again, I'm going to export that data so I can put it in a spreadsheet. And again, we're going to go to File and Export our data out. We're going to do that for each other sample. And that's going to conclude basically the steps of testing this sample out. And so that's the wood testing. We're also going to be doing concrete testing as part of this module. Okay, we're going to be working with our concrete samples, and you're going to have one that's reinforced and one that is not reinforced. So hopefully we have the reinforcements down on the bottom half of the beam when we load. What I'm going to do is take a Sharpie, and I'm going to lay out some lines to where I can have the center of the beam being right here, and then about that, I want to have a line here and here that represent 13 inches apart, centered up on that line right there. Those are going to help me line up the sample in the machine. And in the machine, what we're going to do is use pieces of leather between the consumables on the machine so that we protect it. So this is going to go on the top piece, and we're going to lay this on top, and we're going to come down here and push directly down on that with the machine. Likewise, we're going to have two bottom pieces that are going to go underneath and protecting the machines there. And these are leather. Sometimes we use leather. Sometimes we use rubber to do that. Now, to help with the proper seating of the sample, we, so what we have is this nice little tool called a rub brick that's going to help us prep the surfaces. We want to make sure we don't have any major imperfections. Some of you guys have done a really good job about screeding the top of your material off. Some of you didn't. So maybe I'm going to take that and come up here and just rub that and make sure that surface is nice and flat. Now again, we're gonna make a nice mess. We're gonna do that here on the wood table. If you make a really big mess, clean it up, put it to the trash can, and that way we leave a clean area for the next person. We're gonna do that on the top, and there's two bottom areas that we're gonna to test to make sure we don't have any high points sticking up from the concrete. So once we've done that, let's go to the Shimatsu and set it up for testing. Okay, so what I've done here is I have loaded my sample into the machine, putting the leather between the supports here on the bottoms, and also a piece of leather between the top support here, and I've located my loading device right here at the center line. I'm also putting this nice cardboard box up underneath here so that all the debris, anything that falls, goes into there and it makes cleanup a lot easier. So we've jogged this down, we're ready to come do our test, and what we're going to do is open up the testing method for flexure concrete testing for this lab. It's under the course and title name, so go to, to the testing methods and open up that one, and it's going to be for inches. And what it's going to take in consideration is the width and the height of this part, and it's going to apply the load in terms of stress, 125 pounds per square inches per minute. So it's a stress loading rate per the standard that we're going to be testing this sample. What we would like to be watching is probably the bottom of this and seeing the differences in the crack formations between reinforced and unreinforced samples. So as it's testing, you might want to sit up there and really take note of where and how many cracks it broke. So at this point, I'm going to shut the door, take it off hand jog, and I'm going to come over to the computer and in the computer, I'm going to zero out the force and the stroke data, and now I'm ready to hit start test. And the machine just stopped and saying I hit my max load. That is because basically the concrete, if I look at it, I can see a crack forming 
in the concrete there. So my concrete has failed. So I could save that data at this time. What I want to do is go ahead and, and maybe open that up a little bit more. And if I come in here and actually just come in and crack, you can see where it cracked there, okay? So that's where my crack was forming and when it broke. And if I come up over here and I look at the test data, I can see that I hit my max load there and then I went ahead and broke it the rest of the way. So you need to do this for reinforced and unreinforced concretes, capturing these data points and making note of the different cracks and how they form. Okay, at this point, we're ready to come in and start working with our cylinders to do a compression test. And here's one with the lid on it. We're gonna remove this. And our concrete samples inside, we need to remove this plastic liner. Now for this portion, you need to wear gloves because we're gonna be putting force and we can slip and this tool is sharp and we can cut ourselves. So it's not an option. You need to wear gloves doing this. And we're gonna do this all at the wood bench in our dirty area and when we get done, we're gonna clean up all the mess that we make. Now the idea is to slip this little bill right here down in between the plastic and the concrete and then slide it down where it will split that PVC, revealing the final part. So what you're gonna do is come in there carefully and get it started. And again, this is why we wear the gloves, because if you slip, you'll hit yourself. And then what you wanna do is come in and tap on the top as I go down, and it is gonna split that PVC liner. Okay, once I get that done, I'm gonna be able to come in here and break out my sample from that plastic liner. And now I have my sample that we cast out in lab. Now, when I go to test this, the bottom piece looks nice and smooth. The top piece looks a little rough. Again, I'm gonna take our handy dandy rubber brick, come in here and just rub the top of that so that I take off any of the high about pieces that I can. Now we're gonna have that fairly flat. We're gonna put two pieces of rubber or sometimes we use leather in between these so that we can also accommodate any imperfections on there and then we're going to get the compressive strength of this material out of the cylinder so you're probably going to want to come in here and measure the dimensions of this and record that in your lab sheet and then let's go to the shimatsu and do our test so we're at the large shimatsu this one will do 300,000 newtons and we're just going to use this machine for this portion of the lab to help take the load off some of the smaller shimatsus for loading with all the different groups that we have we're going to be taking our sample and putting it inside the machine there. So what we want to do is come in here and get our fit part set up in a containment system. We're going to use that piece of rubber on the bottom. We're going to use this clear plastic. The concrete's a little bit prouder, so we're going to be loading on the concrete. The idea with the plastic is it's going to allow us to capture all the dirt and contaminants so we don't make a big mess. And we're going to bring it out and we can actually take pictures of that. So we're gonna take this piece of rubber and put it on top and we're gonna be able to compress that sample within the machine. So let's go load that up into the machine here. And I get everything centrally loaded onto the machine and I can hand jog the machine down to just almost where it's gonna make contact with the sample. Now again, this machine is very similar to the other Shimatsus. The nice thing that I like about this one is the teach pin that comes off. And once I get it where it's almost gonna make contact, Okay, still got a little play there. I'm gonna shut these two front doors. And again, you wanna shut the left door first and then the right door because it makes contact with the safety sensors on there. When you get done jogging, take that manual mode off. See, it's on manual mode. Take that off and then hang it back up. And we're ready to go to the computer, select our method and start our test. So we're at the computer and I'm gonna to go to select test method and I'm gonna do the compressive test method on here. Just hit finish. And one thing I have to take note of is this is gonna report my values in Newtons. So we're gonna get Newtons if we're dealing with pounds in a lab sheet, you may need to do some unit conversion there. Now this one is just gonna come in and load the part and we have the brake detection off. And so it's just gonna let us break that sample and it will report back the maximum load. Sometimes you have to full screen this and it will come over here and t report back the maximum force that it took to compress that sample and we can pull that off of the graph as well. So you may want to take a picture of this graph as well as you can go up to file and export that raw data as a common delimited file and save it to your groups folder on the desktop. We've done a lot of that in past experiments and you should know how to do that. So let's go test this sample. 
Okay, we've now got our sample loaded and we're ready to come in here and test it. So before we do that, we need to right click on force and say zero and right click on stroke and say zero. And then we can come in and start the test. Now, when you look at your data, you're probably gonna see some noise at first where it's getting down to the sample and then it's gonna start loading the sample. And so we're coming in and compressing this sample. Now, some of you are gonna ask, does the rubber interfere with our data collection because it's a different material? If we were doing a, a stress, the linear, the modulus elasticity, yes, because we're getting the properties of that rubber. But what we're looking at is the maximum force. And so what's gonna break is gonna be the concrete and we're gonna capture that maximum force of the concrete. So the rubber is just acting as a gap filler and load distributor for this test. And ASTM standards do allow for that rubber piece to be used. Again, they have standards in terms of how many times you can use that rubber piece and how much degradation until you need to replace it. So what we're watching is looking for the concrete to break. And once the concrete breaks, then we're going to be able to come in and stop the test and take pictures of our broken sample. And so you can see it broke right there. And if I see on the stress strain diagram on the plot on the computer, it's going to be basically um, showing that we have a failure as well. So I'm going to go ahead and stop the test. And it has my max load that the sample took before it broke. I'm going to record that and again capture that data in my stress strain diagram. So let's go ahead and remove the sample and look at it. So we just pulled our sample out and the plastic is keeping all the debris contained. We can take pictures of that and look at how the part failed and record that to our lab sheets and be sure to capture that maximum force that it took to break that sample from the computer there.